There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. A dimension of sound. For the 150th time, you are not getting out of here. Please let me finish the Count of Monte Cristo. A dimension of sight. No change at all. What? I, I think I look fine. A dimension of mind. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Fifth Dimension of the Twilight Zone podcast. Once again, I am your host, Nick, and we are back to uh, talk a new episode of the Twilight Zone, Rod Sterling's, not Sterling, Sterling's uh, epic uh, sci-fi series that, you know, probably revolutionized the industry in a lot of ways that, you know, had never really been seen before unless you watch a movie. As always, you can find us on YouTube, still on my account, so I decided to get off my lazy butt and do an actual YouTube account for The Fifth Dimension. Maybe happens sometime in the future. We also have uh, <laughs> Apple Podcasts. We also have google play whatever podcast feeds we have we have you know a way to listen and a way to watch so with that said uh jacob and triv are of course here to talk uh twilight zone as usual yeah. how you guys doing jacob uh especially you how is the uh finally moving into a house with actually space and not having to uh close doors so the family can't hear you talk and sleep and all that good stuff that part's great, but nobody else can hear me talk either because my internet's so crap out here. But hey, we're working on it. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm in a McDonald's drive through in the early 90s. <laughs> Hi, I'm. I, I, <laughs> oh, like Wayne's World? Is that what it yeah. is? Yeah. <laughs> I would like that. And the, that drive through knows exactly what you said. So. Um, how about you, for a Dr. Pecker. <laughs> um, but yeah, your move was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, yeah, my move. It's it was good. It was uh, it's still happening, kind of, because I've still got boxes everywhere. Well, not everywhere. I've got boxes in places throughout the house, but we're getting there. <laughs> Excellent. And what about you, Trev? How was your? Last, I mean, we haven't recorded in like a week and a half. Was that right? Yeah, something like that. I uh, yeah. I I'm lacking space pants. I kind of miss my space pants, honestly. So. uh Hoping to find those again. Exactly. Yeah, do you have pants? That's... <laughs> yeah, that's like true. Like pants in general, or just space hey, pants? <laughs> I have I have pants on, but I'm lacking space pants, as featured uh, in my most recent review. Because yes, they were, yes, I've seen. They were awesome, and I missed them. They were very <laughs> mystical, yes. magical. Yes. yes, they were. You could see my Uranus, not my anus. Was it Uranus. a steaming cup of Uranus? <laughs> <laughs> Question. I mean. <laughs> I don't, I can't see if my cup here on the table is a steaming cup of Uranus, but uh, I'm going <laughs> to guess it probably is. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> um, so today is a somewhat special episode. Um, I have three things I want to mention before we get into the episode. One, Triv, you started this with me. Jacob, you kind of came along as a I think we like had some info on you, blackmailing you and stuff like that. It's third one. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but this is our 20th episode. So that's pretty awesome. We've been doing this for about 21 weeks now, which is cool. We're also, which I'm really excited for, we're talking about an episode I consider one of my favorite episodes, a guilty pleasure episode. It has one of my favorite endings to any Twilight Zone episode ever to begin with. And uh, we have an exciting, awesome guest to talk about this episode, which is, of course, called Elegy. And um, here we have to introduce is Alex Carson, who has a YouTube channel uh, that actually has talked about the specific episode. So uh, Alex, welcome to our podcast. How are you doing? Hello. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks I hope for you're, having uh... me. Oh, definitely. With that said, you, uh, the reason I, you p- I picked this episode because you said it was one of your favorites, but I, I have to ask, as I always do when a guest comes on, what Drew, what drew you to Twilight Zone? What, you know, what was it about going into the series that you really were excited about? Because Twilight Zone, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't watch that series. That's like 70 years old. I'm like, it's like one of the greatest sci-fi shows of all time. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like, I think what drew me into the Twilight Zone is having so many people talk about it before I did. I ended up binging all the series about a year and a half ago. And I think my larger takeaway is that as much as it is takes as much as it does take place in a dimension of imagination there's so much of a sense of reality and humanity that also is sprinkled in in the way that it does commentate um 
both visually and also um, through dialogue, a lot of that, I, the way that it evokes just the human experience in such a way that you really could relate to it or could find yourself attaching yourself to it, even for how goofy or comical it becomes. I think there are a lot of great episodes that offer just a huge mix. I think also because of it being an anthology, it's really great to attach yourself to unique storylines. So everyone has a very different personal preference. I know that for myself, even very recently, I've watched the original Outer Limits series, and I've kind of found myself connecting to in a very similar way to The Twilight Zone, where I feel like more of my excitement of even talking about it is more so kind of hearing what other people's thoughts are on it and like what kind of episodes stand out to them in comparison to kind of my own list. So awesome. Awesome. Now you, um, you said actually you, it was kind of interesting because um, I asked you before that we start recording, mm -hmm. like, what was your favorite episode? You know, everybody has like that one episode that, you know, is not the 16 millimeter shrine, but is like, <laughs> like, for instance, the monsters to do a maple string and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you brought up an episode that I knew a little bit about, but is in a season that is never really truly loved for Twilight Zone fans. But I was actually very interested in you told me your what was your favorite episode again? A miniature from season Nature, four which is the uh hour-long episodes right yeah so which is uh which is cool because you know that's what like i said one of these series when they were starting to stream twilight zone they actually didn't even stream the fourth season for like the longest time because they were quote unquote i think they were quote unquote ashamed of it but yeah it's a it's a really it's really cool that you uh enjoy the, the fourth season like that because like i said it brings in some really interesting material that expands upon the, the 25 minutes so um, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's kind of yeah. mixed. <laughs> no, no. Some it, of the four episodes are like, yeah. they're like just okay. But like, I mean, even having one of them kind of be my favorite episode is definitely surprising more than anything. But, you know, mm -hmm. there definitely are a good couple, a good couple episodes in season four. I think, I think it's worth watching if you've been to the series. Yeah. Cause be I think that season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 100%. Cause I think that season has the one you didn't like, Trev, the, um, What's uh, that episode? Jess, Jess Bell. I, I just, Jess I Bell. don't know. It just, I don't know. It's one of those episodes. It just, it, it's like 16 millimeter shrine for you is like Jess Bell for me. And I know uh, Jacob over there is going, what are you guys talking about? I don't remember <laughs> any of these. I do remember some of them, um, even though I binged them 20 years ago. Alex, awesome to have you on the show. I can't wait to talk about this. I'm sure you have plenty of uh, good insight in this episode. Like you say, it's one of your favorite episodes. So we're talking about an episode like uh, I was saying earlier, it's one that I've seen so many times that I've forgotten. I've probably seen this like 20, 25 times now, just in my, you know, in my watching of Twilight Zone. But it is, of course, season one, episode 20, which, of course, is Elegy. Uh, it is directed by Douglas Hayes, written by Charles Beaumont, which I can't remember. I think he's written a couple of film, a couple episodes by now. He did write the one that's your favorite, Alex, which I know I was looking up. It's based off his story, which of course, and uh, it's production code 173 3625, which actually means it's the 25th episode recorded and it aired on February 19th, 1960. Stars Cecil Calloway, who's an Oscar nominated actor, plays Jeremy Wickbyer, uh, Jeff Morrow, who plays Kurt Myers, Kevin Hagan as Captain James Weber, and Don Dubbins as Peter Kirby. I literally just call him the astronauts because I couldn't remember which one was which um as we as we talk about this episode so you guys will be correcting me i'm sure a lot but as we always do in this in this podcast is fifth dimension did you guys anyone can answer this did you know anything about this episode going in i know alex you said you you said you've like one of the first times watching it in last year is that correct it was in Am 2020 right i was 20 i was say it was a couple of years yeah. ago okay mm -hmm. um yeah the years have been weird since the pandemic started <laughs> but um well, let me ask you this, um, especially Triv and Jacob. Did you guys remember this episode at all? Did you guys know anything about it going in? Because like I said, I've seen it before, so I knew. But did you know you were getting yourself into it this episode? Honestly, I don't remember seeing this one. And I'm, I'm sure I have. But I like watching it. The ending, it didn't catch me by surprise. But the way it went down caught me by surprise. So I know I've seen it at one point. But I was, I was kind of in the dark with this one. And kind of ashamed to say that <laughs> well that's good it's good when that happens uh, i remember it, it seemed familiar to me but i didn't i couldn't remember any details about it but as i was watching i was like i know i've seen this 
I mean, beyond the fact that I know I've seen them all, but like, I was like, yeah, this seems familiar, but I couldn't remember any specifics about it. So that's always nice when we come up on an episode that I couldn't remember anything about. So it's kind of like, Ooh, what's the twist? And I didn't guess what the twist was, but I mean, no, I don't recall seeing this. I mean, unless you say like, I, I remember seeing Westworld, which mm. so we'll talk about that, that down, actually. This is, this is yeah, this <laughs> very reminiscent of that once you get closer to the end, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing with you, Alex. Did you kind of like I guess in as when you finished it, did you see where it was going as it was moving along, or did it surprise you? Or I feel like it's one of those episodes that's kind of unique in that. I think once you see it for the first time, I at least mm-hmm. for me, it kind of stuck with me. So I kind of knew what the story beats were kind of watching it again. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure like it's definitely one of those episodes that's really good on a first watch for sure. Because right. I think that's where a lot of that shock value kind of comes in for the ending. Yeah. Well, let me let me actually ask you this question. Um, so I, I'm assuming you watched all the episodes in order or did you just kind of you watch them from season one, season two, like from one to 30. I watched I watched all them in order except for season four. I watched season four at the very end. After watching like 19 episodes, did you feel that this episode was getting to a point where you could like, you know, for instance, the episodes follow some kind of pattern where there's an opening, closing and so on and so forth. Did you mm-hmm. start feeling comfortable with where the series was kind of heading with this anthology, all that good stuff that makes sense? That's a good question. I would say no (laughs) but I think it's just because I just think there's so many unexpected twists and turns that I think for me honestly I was just sort of like I didn't really have any expectations or idea Mm -hmm. of where each of them were going so I genuinely was sort of surprised especially for the episodes that I ended up really really liking I know that's very different for other people where it's like oh yeah it's like I totally knew that was gonna happen you know but it's like I mean, that's more Scooby-Doo route, but, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I'd say for Um, the Twilight Zone, it's very different from Scooby-Doo in that regard. Well, and so much of this is so ingrained in culture, like, you know, mm. the the story of, um, um, Mm. oh, what the hell is his name? Time Enough at Last, um, the guy from that. Oh, Uh, Burgess Meredith? Thank you, Burgess Meredith. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, you know, that whole storyline has been done so many times, whether you're talking Futurama or other associated things, even if it's just little nods here and there you see it and it's like oh i know this thing like to be back in the 60s and to see these live for the first time would have been a hell of a thing the thing about this episode is i think it's just after after watching the purple testament the purple Hmm. tesco whatever you want to call it (laughs) i think i I think this exactly uh i I was going to change our name to that podcast the testamentical um (laughs) But I think after watching the episode being so heavy handed, even though it was a great episode, I think this was a nice, like, nice palate cleanser, I guess you could say, because like I said, um, as you know, Alex and everybody, Mirror Image is coming up next. And then the Monsters Are Due on Maple Street is coming up after that. And the Monsters Are Due on Maple Street is like the Purple Testament, where it's just very heavy handed and what it's trying to do. So having an episode like this, dealing with what it's dealing with being kind of laid back and goofy and silly, but fun and, you know, twisty and turny for what it is. I I think that's nice to have. And I think that's why I like this episode so much for what it's worth. But to talk about the plot, it's pretty, pretty basic. And it's kind of straightforwardness. It's basically three men are landing landing in a like miniature spaceship, I guess you could say uh, that's in the (laughs) background there. It's, it's like a really cool effect for the, you know, sixties. But it's very, you know, very of its time. But, you know, they're, you know, they're basically landing on what they think maybe Earth or something like that. And that's actually uh, when the opening narration happens for you, Jacob. The time is the day after tomorrow. The place, a far off corner of the universe. A cast of characters. Three men lost amongst the stars. Three men sharing the common urgency of all men lost. They're looking for home. And in a moment, they'll find home. Not a home that is a place to be seen but a strange, unexplainable experience to be felt. That's uh, some wise words there from, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if, I don't know if, Papa Sir, that or, sir. yeah, 
it's pretty much giving you the gist of they're landing on a planet. They don't know if it's Earth or not, but they've been, as they talk about, they've been traveling for, what is it, six months now six in months. this episode? Yeah, at the point when this episode starts. There are 650. This is another funny joke. We talked about this in, I think, um, Third from the Sun, is the time is the distance of space and time in the Twilight Zone is a little wonky because they're talking about there's 650 mile, a million miles from Earth, which is a lot bigger distance when well, third rock, third from the sun was. But the I was reading up on it, it's basically from Jupiter to Saturn, Saturn, I'm, it's between Jupiter yeah. and Saturn, yeah. yeah so uh, that's a the distance is kind of wonky there, but because um, they mentioned that it's a far corner of the universe, which yeah, Jupiter and Saturn are not. A far corner of the universe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I mean, you know, they didn't know. And hey, it's another dimension. The fifth dimension. So maybe there it is. <laughs> um, but they land and then they check the oxygen and what's that other stuff? Carbon dioxide temperatures Nit- and all these nitrogen. Or nitrogen. nitrogen. Yeah, yep. thank you. Nitrogen. I think carbon dioxide would kill you at some point. Um and <laughs> they open the door. Instead of putting helmets on, they open the door because that's what you do in a strange new world. And uh, 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 not a world. This yeah. is well, Twilight we don't know. Zone. We don't, we don't, they're on an asteroid. This is the Twilight Zone. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they don't land on worlds. They land on asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's and always an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about uh, that too is um, they they were out of gas. Like they couldn't go any further. So one way or the other, you know, they were either going to be sucked into the vacuum of you know something have a face hugger hit them or find Ooh. something that was you know semi semi or, you know livable they're just lucky that neen didn't come and run over him in her car yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, name? Nine, nan. Nan, nan, nan. Nan, nan adams nan. yeah yeah nan adams that's it nan yeah. adams i was just waiting for that buick or whatever she was driving to like <laughs> come flying out of there like ah! <laughs> that's the alternate cut that's the yeah. r-rated version <laughs> You'd be surprised how many and times on the Twilight Zone someone gets hit by a car. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are a few more times where it happens. <laughs> oh, I don't doubt it. But do That's any of them to... stand up to what was the episode? Uh, uh, what What you wish. What you, or... No, what you want. What you what, need. What, what you need. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I made all the no limit jokes. Uh, <laughs> Shoes flying yeah, off. God, that, was like that. that was amazing. <laughs> that was the best special effects I've ever seen. I <laughs> <laughs> um, loved it. But this is this is kind of the starting point of they see a farm with a tractor and a, a dog that apparently needs seems to be stuffed or whatever, it's not moving. Yeah. <laughs> they walk out, and what's really interesting is because they start talking about, I mean, as they talk about in the episode, there was a war, there was a nuclear weapon or some kind of weapon destroyed the earth. It wasn't atomic traveling. war, I was believe, it like 200 war? years earlier, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they've been kind of like trying to you know bring back earth and stuff like that and i like the fact that they have they don't recognize they recognize it from like you know let's say history books but the stuff they see is not like normal to them they live in a different kind of time frame so there's no uh no towns or no like uh barns and stuff like that it's just really interesting to see how they react to everything and i thought that was a really clever way for charles beaumont to kind of uh differentiate these people from who we are from you know learning and there's a lot of you know precious stuff that deal, deals with this episode about how we're kind of moving towards like some really destructive things but what did you guys think about like them kind of going because i kind of group it all together they go through the town they see like the band playing they see the music and the the, the speakers and stuff like that did you guys kind of formulate what was going to happen? Did you kind of go, is this like Madame Tussauds or is this like, uh, you know, are they in the land of like, you know, people just don't move? Like, what did you guys think as this was moving along to the point where they eventually walk into the building, which I'll talk about in a couple seconds. Um, whoever wants to, wants to go on that one. What do you guys think overall with the kind of where it was starting to head? I, I kind of assumed that it was maybe like they were moving faster than light since they had mm-hmm. talked about going, um, with light speed and stuff, I thought maybe there was people were just moving super slow because obviously with humans, you know, you can only hold still for so long and you're never going to be mannequin still. I thought maybe mm-hmm. that was maybe part of it. They played that into the story of it, but what about uh, Alex? What'd you, what'd you think? I honestly thought they were kind of, I mean, I feel like the huge unsettling factor of it all is that they are still, I mean, obviously because your human beings are still going to make those sort of small, minute movement movements without really mm-hmm. being that stationary. So I kind of assumed that they were just kind of placed as 
statues that I guess were animate in some regard, but maybe not to the extent of being like fully human. Right. Well, (laughs) before I get to that, we looked over (laughs) some things. First of all, when they're coming in for that landing and they say, hey, get in your whatever seat. I mean, really, how how safe is this seat that they all sat in? It's like a bench seat with a a two-inch railing next to it. I just made note of that. I'm just saying, just throwing that out there. I know it was 19. This is why we actually have you on the podcast, Jacob, because you know some things that I don't talk about. (laughs) And I don't know if any of you picked up on it, but uh, I heard it, and then I did actually see it on a website as well when I was looking into it. But yeah, it was that there are Star Trek bridge sounds in the background of their spaceship. And I found out that, yes, X amount of years, I think it was like six or seven years later when Star Trek actually started, that those were the actual sounds that they used there. I heard them immediately. Maybe that means I'm a Trekkie. I don't know. But um, because as soon as I heard them, I was like, number one, (laughs) wrong Star Trek, but whatever, you know. And uh, yeah, that's all I really picked up there in the beginning. But as far as like the people and what they find on this planet. Uh, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I thought that dog was kind of funny, honestly. Oh, well, that was um, hilarious. I did like <laughs> and knocking knock over the fisherman. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did like how uh, it, it wasn't just still shots that they took because you could always tell a still shot in a, in a show yeah. or a movie when they do it. It just doesn't have the same. You could tell a difference between a even if nothing's moving in the picture or in the uh, video. You can always tell the difference between video and still shots. And they did use some, but a lot of it was just people standing very, very still. And even though you could see them making minute movements movements here or there, it actually kind of makes sense with where the episode goes. I did really like how um, I thought it was, this seemed like a a point that would be made in like sci-fi of today uh, when he said, maybe we're moving, you know, really fast. Maybe in this place, time moves differently. And we're moving at our regular time and they're just moving really slow to us. And I was like, well, that's a really neat idea. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why we see these little minute movement. I mean, we, the reason we see them is because people can't stand, like Alex said, they can't stand completely still, but exactly. maybe that's how they're explaining that away. I mean, obviously that's not what it is, but I mean, <laughs> I thought that was a really cool idea. I was like, oh, that's neat. Somebody thought of that because that does sound like something that we see in some more modern or later on sci-fi. So I thought that was pretty neat. But no, at this point, I had I had no idea what was going on. I hadn't well, guessed well, it. One thing I did notice also, and this is a very minute, weird little thing, but as they cross the bridge above the, the fisherman guy, there is a still shot of yep. the three astronauts. And it's, it was one of those things where it was, it was a total still shot. It's and the was, same shot that they use right after that, because I noticed that too. There's yeah. a shot right after that where he looks up, where he's looking at the fisherman down on the ground, and you see them in the background. It's the same shot zoomed in. Oh, there you go. Nice. With it, I'm kinda... assuming they just didn't get that shot, and in editing, they said, hey, we need a shot of these guys being like, oh, and they just <laughs> took that, zoomed it in, cropped it, which, you know, we can do in like 10 seconds now. It probably took them a whole day back then. <laughs> <laughs> like compositing. And they also mentioned the binary sun, which I thought was a clever kind of you know tell that they're not on earth i guess you could say so um how about them two suns between jupiter and saturn though <laughs> <laughs> we're not nitpicking uh, those. <laughs> nah well how about how about the fact it's got 100 percent atmosphere and it's an asteroid i wasn't going to mention it i mentioned that like two like the two previous episodes of Rome <laughs> i give up um, <laughs> that's why i'm wearing say, the party hat bringing up old uh, stuff you got the pizza hat yeah they got the pizza hat I mean, at least it's not uh at least it's not in the middle of the desert where the director of photography is falling over dead you know oh god like in the <laughs> lonely. yeah that was um the, the lonely my yeah. first episode well the first yeah. episode i guess is i guess guess start get i don't know i was on yeah I don't know what we call it <laughs> it was the first um, episode where you joined us and you liked us so much you never said goodbye then oh okay good b- belated goodbye but i'm still here yay you, oh, and wait, Jeff, you, mean, man. you mean i stayed that's why I just, you stayed i, I yes. totally i that was whoosh, over the head <laughs> moving okay. on so this episode good stuff <laughs> <laughs> good stuff here <laughs> cut that out Nick. I'm, like no, I'm, keep- <laughs> yeah. I'm keeping I'm it all in i damn it. look dumb enough on my channel okay i can't be looking dumb on other people's channels too Wait, hey, hey, Alex is the official editor of this episode, so she gets to say what stays in. So if you say something really bad, she's like, I like that. 
Hey, staying in. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, anyway, so a good portion of this episode before the end of the act, and we meet the caretaker, which is Wirewick, is basically them walking into a house from the town hall, which is where all the the trumpet players and players and stuff like that were, and. It's always it's always noticeable, as you guys said, as the people are trying to stand still. It's impossible to stand still, especially for probably many, many takes or whatever many takes they had. But it's pretty impressive, the scenes that they're setting up, especially for what they're doing, because the first one is the electoral mayor and they're setting down the steps and stuff like that. And then they walk in and, you know, it's different set pieces and different settings. And they walk, you know, one of the astronauts walks into the room and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, miss. And he walks back in and it's like uh, mariachi band and stuff like that. But <laughs> there, <there's, laughs> it, it, it was it was it, it, yeah, it's it's one of those weird things that they put in there, but like the like the beginning of this kind of segment i mean it's the same question i have like the stuff that's happening and i make no jokes it really felt like you're in like a madame tussauds where you know i don't know if you guys have ever been in a madame tussauds it's very weird to be in there very strange when you see like lifelike figures but it's really kind of interesting i guess you could say and i was thinking like I, I kind of saw where the episode was going at this point. I kind of had a feeling that there was something that was going to happen to the astronauts where they were going to be as we, as we learn later on. But like, what did you guys think about the, like the different set pieces and how that kind of worked together and how that played together? Was it something that you felt they did a really nice job on? Do you feel like they could have done a better job on like, what was your guys's take on that section? Cause like I said, it's a lot of like different, rooms it's like like as you said jacob westworld whereas we learned from what wyrick says there's like a roman place and there's a a western he, place and so on and so he forth. mentioned so what do you, every one of the westworld places when he went exactly it's like it's is this where Crichton got the idea yeah. possible i mean everything yeah. is inspired by something else i mean it, it exactly. was like he mentioned every from the original westworld movie he mentioned every single part of westworld in this little thing they got set up that we'll talk about is it was kind of uncanny but that is cool you guys go first i remember in the companion books they kind of mentioned that they intentionally were they meant to shoot for three days and extended it to four because of how many Mm -hmm. unique um set pieces there were that they had to navigate equipment and crew through and i can totally believe that i think that oh god if the believability factors i mean obviously it's said later by wick wire that this sort of i guess setting of american culture as kind of he referred it to as being sort of one of the more popular and i think that in itself Mm -hmm. is kind of interesting because in a way it simultaneously is trying to be a time capsule of how america was at the time or how they perceived america because it was so contemporary um obviously we're kind of looking at it more in hindsight but i think it adds a lot to um to have these different sort of glimpses of I guess a life, quote unquote, even though there isn't really. And I know even something mentioned in the companions too was that original. Well, originally in Charles Beaumont's short story, they mentioned that at least in the companions that there was um, a mention of like a racing car tableau, which is kind of funny because even they say it's like it's just be parked cars with people and <laughs> it just being completely still, which is like <laughs> it's just kind of hilarious to think about that almost being there. But they placed it in exchange for, I believe it was the beauty pageant scene. Yeah, it was. Because right. that seemed to be more believable, I guess, to just have people just standing there still and smiling, posing. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sure. I'm, I mean, I'm, yeah, I guess that's how, I guess that's how life works. Just like, you know, if a race car tableau can't work, you just put in a pageant and, you know, everything's <laughs> great in the world. Exactly. Um, exactly yeah. when in doubt add bikinis <laughs> yeah <laughs> you stop it well, you're trying to you're, you're she's trying to provoke me nick <laughs> i know she is i'm i'm, I'm gonna to get... let yourself get in trouble man <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, I'll, I'll go back to you two as well what did you on the original question of like you know what did you think of that overall like scene like did it kind of like start turning the wheels and gears and stuff like that i think it definitely like it expanded you know obviously it expanded out on on what you were seeing and it opened up the world as to you know what was in front of you and possibilities as to what was going on i don't know i i still kind of kept with the okay you know you kind of go through all the all the scenarios that it could be you know is it frozen people in time is it they're moving faster than everybody else is it um 
mannequins you know what is the what is the purpose why does this one mayoral guy get to stand at the top of the stairs while everybody you know is blinking down below and and you know has to try and maintain stillness for like an extended amount of time i like like triv and alex said i uh, at that point i still didn't know what it was and i was like triv said kind of like going through my head trying to figure out what it was um one of the things if it was frozen in time i didn't think it was frozen in time because if it was it was very unrealistically done because if they were frozen in time you would have at least three four five people per room that would be frozen like when you pause a dvd and the person always looks like like that somebody (laughs) would be frozen like that but no everybody looked perfect so i was like nope it's not that they're not frozen in time not every one of these people looked perfect when they're frozen. So it's not that. So I didn't know what it was. Um, I did make note of <clears throat> that at some point during when going through all these rooms, they do the thing that you should never do. And I don't know why people do it. And I will probably, if ever caught in one of these situations, I will probably do it, is they split up. Why the hell? You're on an alien world or asteroid <laughs> or whatever. Something weird's going on. Hey, let's split up right after we got here. No, just stay together. <laughs> Nobody's moving. Nothing's happening. You got time why why would you split up and go to these places i mean i know why to move the plot along but still that's just a terrible idea um i did make also i also made note that i don't think we may not be quite to this part but there's a 16 millimeter shrine yeah uh, the last episode the, that's the, hospital. the mayor fitch scene yeah yeah, yeah. is it yeah, what well, no scene. i thought it was it's the hospital it scene they... from purple testament yeah but the well it's that and it's the set is used again but isn't it it's it's is it the mayor finch scene or is it the yes. when they go with with whoever that guy when they go inside that house i thought it was in there because that's no, the one where the i was like mayor hey. finch stairs yep pretty much oh, like okay. that hallway and stairs was used in both of those oh. episodes yeah okay well um yeah i saw that it was in there and i was like oh yeah i, I said that that was 16 millimeter shrine i just thought it was a different part of the episode but whatever so yeah i i liked when they were going around uh i did notice that when they went to the beauty pageant and uh he was walking through there because i thought it was sort of neat how they were just seeing all the people in like these you know frozen in place and he walks in the beauty pageant and he's walking around just talking to these frozen people and he walks up to the woman who i guess just won you know i ain't trying to shame nobody but he walks up (laughs) to the woman who won and he's like you are beautiful or you are the prettiest of all I mean, I guess that's a subjective comment, but I just got to say, really the prettiest? Are you sure about that? I mean, I mean, good for her. equal opportunity she, back yeah, in the I'm day. I'm glad she won, <laughs> but there was like some uh, individuals right around this individual that I was like, I mean, they they should have won probably. Actually, but you know what? That's just me. What? You know, you know why that is? It's well, like the mayor... The- yeah, she's the one that died, or she's the uh, one that... The, the, she's the focus. Don't spoil it! <laughs> I can't help it. You... You forced my hand. It's like I the just, mayoral candidate. Like, yeah, who would? That makes sense. I, I can't say that I would have confidence in him. You know, just yeah, his yeah. his his shoulders were too pudding esque for my. Yeah, yeah pudding for shoulders life. for sure. He's a yes. crumb bum. Yes. But uh, yeah, I I think you're. You know what? You're right. <laughs> you're right. You stopped me in my tracks right there. Yes. She was probably what we're gonna find out's going on. She was the one in that scene, which makes me wonder: Is it every single scene? Well, we'll get to that. Like each area is only one yeah i think you're i think you're in the right in essence kind of in the right direction but i think there's the thing that made me laugh a little bit that's kind of funny is the astronauts it's pretty much in the pageant he's just yelling at these (laughs) things and i'm like why are you yelling (laughs) like this is like when um i don't know uh the lonely when he's just yelling at the the robot it's just like robot uh, losing yeah robot yes (laughs) Yes, Alex brought that up and reminded me of Robus, which is... Oh, we're going to talk about Robus in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but the, they kind of group back together, and then they decide they're going to go out exploring because this is their new whole world. And that's when we have the the, the dramatic, you know, hamster turn of Wickwire. He's like... Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> he and the, the newspaper came down, like, right as the stinger hit. Yeah. All that so well done and um yeah it's a fun little sequence but he um that's the end of the first act so that's where it goes to commercial and i have to ask you guys what did you think of that first act what was your overall thoughts like you know we talked about how much we love the purple testament but did you still even though this is like absurd uh sci-fi what's going on and what you know the the ideas and concepts what did you guys think of the first act of the episode 
you know, I thought I, I will always say I love it. It's just my cup of tea. But what do you guys think? <laughs> Honestly, I feel like the first half really works in mm-hmm. the fact that we kind of are following the astronauts vicariously through them in a way and trying to figure out sort of the mystery along with them at the same time. It definitely is very more spectacle heavy than when we get into the second half of the episode. But I think it does work because I think it adds to more of that visual intrigue and then you're kind of given more of the reason as to why at the very end I think it does work having it split in half like that and so that's not always as evenly distributed in other episodes yeah yeah sure. that's that's a the lonely is a perfect example of that it's like heavy it's heavy on one side with like a scale where like the last is it I can't remember if it's the last half or the first whatever half is is like leaning like this or like this or something like that. And it just becomes more interesting in one part of the episode than the other. But like you said, this is more evenly put out. But what about you guys? What do you think, Triv, Jacob? Well, I don't know how they were going to figure out timing because the clock didn't have um, hands on it. And if they said, oh, we'll be back in an hour. How did they know what an hour was? What if, what if the ones... I hope they have watches or something. <laughs> <laughs> they have pocket watches. They're like... Something. Exactly. I mean... Yeah, that one clock didn't have hands on it, so you don't mean yeah, they had their about? own means of telling time. <laughs> <laughs> it was to throw you off for what was going on, I'm sure. But yes, I mean, these guys left there. They didn't go through an airlock to go out into the new planet. They just basically opened it up without helmets on. So we're not necessarily dealing with you know you know top level astronauts here. They're kind of they're kind of the the guys that were picking their nose at the back of class. Yeah, they they don't do they don't My do uh, miles very well. Okay, so I I liked I like this episode. I like those those where am I what's going on something weird kind of episodes like this that are like in the small towns and like the the really out there ones. I like those kind of episodes. I mean, I like them all, but the ones where it's like oh, there's you know. Um, we're in a town or something and everybody's like this one everybody's frozen or you know everybody's gone and you've got like one or just a few people like walking around trying to figure out you know what's going on the whole episode i like those episodes i like those types of movies i like all that stuff um so yeah i was i was digging this one i liked it um it was it had its goofy moments i guess but it's kind of like, I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? You walk up to people that you're touching and they said that when they touched them, they felt real, they felt warm, they felt like they were alive, but they are frozen. So, I mean, yelling at the people seems a bit odd to me. <laughs> but, I mean, who knows? When in Rome, maybe that's what you do. I don't, I mean, <laughs> wake up, you know, I don't know. That is how they greet each other in 2185. Yeah, it's yeah. 200 something years in the future 200 years in the future at that point so maybe that's you know that's how they greet they just speak very loudly we've our our hearing has evolved away and everybody talks loud i don't know but yeah i was (laughs) i was liking it up to the uh up to this point for sure yeah i was kind of thinking too with the tableau factor i know that madame tussauds was mentioned and at least from my experience going to madame tussauds i guess it's sort of i guess what's fascinating about it is that the wax figures are more so placed in like individual photo ops for the most part, even mm-hmm. though some of them might be sectioned off or like categorized, like you'll have like athletes in one section or mm. singers in another. Um, and I guess what's interesting here, and I think what makes it really appealing for this episode is that you have, it very much is an ensemble piece, but more so with like, like background characters. So I feel that it sort of adds to the episode in itself because you usually would see maybe wax figures on their own. But ta- hypothetically speaking, because these are tableaus with, I guess, inanimate fi- figures that like questionably could be that or something else, it's definitely a different sort of experience to walk through in comparison. And I know this isn't, I know um, in season four, there actually is an episode called The New Exhibit that is based around wax figures, but it's more so on like notorious criminals and it gets kind of weird uh <laughs> I will admit. that's all of season but, four <laughs> yeah for the most part um but I guess it is interesting because in that one too they have um each I mean there very much is an exhibit for the criminals themselves I think they're like a handful of them but they each are given their own individual like um podium so to say um uh, and display behind them and I think that is sort of a different sort of immersive experience than what is shown here very true so i put that out there i was just gonna say the this has to be one of the biggest like 
casts that we've had so far for twilight mm. zone like just the amount of people even if you reuse them like the the pageant the scene had so many people so did the the mayor scene there's yeah. all those people picked i mean it's like a the extras there are shit tons of extras in this one i mean you're talking yeah. at least 15 or so people per shot in addition to the main the main focus yeah yeah i mean I'm, I'm curious about like how much they spent on extras and stuff like that if it was like uh they're like day players or how you uh, i'm assuming this was filmed over like five six days four or five days or whatever it was i think but uh, yeah alex said four days so was it four days total yeah. I, I can't remember if it was in this episode, but there's always been a segment where they're staring at a mirror or they're looking to a mirror. It's kind of look, looking into themselves and stuff like that. And I can't remember if this was in this episode or not, but it's the same kind of thing. It was like, a, you know, like I was saying, where there always seems to be a kind of a connecting thing about how they use kind of characters and objects and they find interesting ways, you know, for instance, here, they, it's kind of like, you know, mannequins and stuff like that. But I, I don't know. I just, I found the, I found as a first act, very interesting to, you know, be fun and be creative, but also, you know, what is this world? What is going on? And I like that fact that even if you kind of know where it's going, you still don't know where it's going, which I thought was cool. So definitely mirror image has a lot of that. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of um, more of that illusionary factor. Mm -hmm with kind of a self-reflection um for sure i don't yeah. remember it being in this one though no which i thought was kind of surprising because like i said you know you go all the way back to uh where is everybody and it's you know it's a i i always feel like ross Sterling and his writers had a really interesting kind of concept of what they were going with so um okay so act two is yeah. uh where the juicy stuff starts truly happening so the astronauts are rem one of the astronauts reminisces about his uncle because they see the picturesque 60s you know street or whatever he says his father or uncle or something like that yes uncle showed it to him many many years ago uh i mean they're like oh it's our home from for now or from now on for the astronauts stuff like that they get to the steps of a victorian house and i guess either, either the house is connected to where they just came from or Whitwire has a speed of the, the was it the $6 million man or something like that, where you can just like <laughs> run real quick. And he's sitting on top of the porch, basically reading a paper again. And what's cool is they're like all caught off guard. They're like, wait, there's somebody alive? Which Ooh. I thought was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I mean, that was cool. Like, it's, it's nice to have somebody to kind of play off of, you know, these, we're just, it's not just the astronauts through the whole episode. Like, uh, I think uh, you know, I shot an arrow into the air or something like that. But uh, Wickwire is an older gentleman. He is an individual that, you know, seems like he knows the place because he's lived here, as we learned later on, for quite a while. But this is where we get, you know, kind of the details of the atomic war it happened in 1985, apparently the same year as Back to the Future came out or something like that. Apparently the <laughs> alternate yeah, nuclear well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well they start they opened up the mortuary in 1975 so i mean 1973 you know, oh 73 sorry yep i'm just i'm sticking to the fives like in back to the future but <laughs> um so yeah the atomic war in 1985 nuked the earth it took 200 years it basically took it's taken them a while it's kind of like folly or something like that where it's taking forever to get back uh on track which you know at that point, uh, the, uh, it's going to take a while. But they walk into the house, and you know, Wickwire is explaining slowly to them about what this place is. We learn it is a cemetery. Uh, it's a mortuary from Happy Glades, I think it's yep. called. Yeah, Happy Glades. And he offers them a snack, a drink, and he brings a drink to them. You know, if I'm forgetting anything, please, please add in the stuff. Um, I know I tend to do that, but as we're getting this information and everything's happening with Wickwire, not to kind of you know spoil the conclusion to the episode, when he offers them the drink and he's explaining what's going on, that this is a cemetery, that this is a mortuary for people who have paid that want to, in essence, be set up to, you know, to be certain sections, certain areas, as Jacob was alluding to earlier. Did you guys pretty much get an idea that these guys are not going to make it? I mean, we we'll see what happens later on. You know, it's kind of I'm kind of spoiling a little bit, but did you guys see where this was kind of heading? I mean, when somebody that you don't know hands you a drink, it's almost a little obvious that there's going to be some kind of uh, conclusion with these guys, and it doesn't maybe go where you think it's going to go. But I mean, what do you guys think about Wickwire, his introduction, what he explains to him, the drink and stuff like that? And Alex, I'll let you go ahead and talk about that all that stuff. If you want to add anything in, please do. They're just too trustworthy about it. Like they're not even like they meet this random guy who will 
find out is not exactly may or may not be human it's just so funny how they're like oh yeah i'll just just take a drink from this random guy I've never met on this random planet with all these people frozen in time or something and then they're like okay with it and then later on they're like later on they're like oh I feel the repercussions of it's like well I mean you should have <laughs> seen that coming I think I yeah. mean yeah it's like stranger gender 101 <laughs> like, <laughs> like you don't you bring your own drink you bring your own <laughs> snacks you know I don't know I I I did I did actually think that was kind of funny. I was like, I almost felt like um I don't know if anyone's familiar with like Dory the Explorer. It's like swipe or no swiping, and I'm like, don't <laughs> drink it. <laughs> Just say no. It's fine. Yeah, it's it it really is like okay. Common sense would tell me that this drink is probably not good for me. Maybe I should run away really quickly, do a Forrest Gump and run quickly out the door to my spaceship where there's probably drinks and stuff like that that are healthy for you. Uh, but what about you two? What do you guys think, uh, Jacob or Triv? So I when when they toasted, pizza, <laughs> <laughs> when when they toasted to everlasting peace, it's like mm. okay, really really we're gonna go there i i will say in their defense i think because they literally didn't have a choice like their spaceship wasn't taken off they were they were stuck there so i i that doesn't mean that you're not careful and everything on your new home but i think that that does play into it i will also say that the like they talked about where this is going i can't imagine wanting to mow my lawn for as being <laughs> that thing or being an ice cream man like who was that for you know yeah uh i i didn't see where it was going exactly honestly um really that's I, that's kind of surprising I, yeah i i'm usually i'm not not but not just up. you i'm just saying in general because it's like as alex said it's pretty if you think about it, if you really go back and think about it it's actually kind of in your face i mean I, <laughs> I know once you mentioned it was a cemetery and all that, <clears throat> I saw, I understood what was going on when he said that and he gave a little bit of an explanation. I was like, okay, yeah, I get that. I didn't know what was going to happen to them. Now, when it comes to the drink thing, he <laughs> seemed a little bit too forceful with them drinks. So now I thought that they were probably going to be frozen because at that, at the point that they received the drinks, I was like, yeah, there's something in those drinks and they're just real quick to take them. And they're just like, whatever, sure. We don't know you. I mean, everybody else is frozen here and you're the only one that's not. And you're giving off vibes that you know what's going on and you might be in you know, charge of it all. And you're giving me a drink and you're really wanting us to take this drink. I think I might be the one who just holds it. Kind of like when somebody gives you a nasty drink or something bad to eat and you don't want to like offend. I just like, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, <are> you? <laughs> you know, or just, I don't know if I would have drank it. I may have held it. It's just been, you know, courteous, but I don't think I would have drank it. But um, I I didn't know it was going to kill them so much as I thought it was going to maybe freeze them or whatever was going on with the people. Now, as he kept talking and he said, yeah, these people are all dead. I was like, mm, are you going to end up as like one of the side characters? And then when he said, what wish could you have? And as it went on, it was a bit more in your face of kind of like, yeah, he's setting your ass up. <laughs> you guys are going to be in one of these little set pieces these dioramas he's got going on so get ready for that <laughs> i did honestly think um i had to actually go back and watch it because i thought that one of the astronauts didn't drink it right away but then obviously all three of them did so oh man it was like some starving ethiopians on that stuff they just yeah. <laughs> i guess they didn't have yeah, any like it's... potable water on their ship or something I mean, they've been traveling for six months. I guess they uh, are dying for thirst. But I mean, it's the thing that is really kind of interesting about it is just the simple fact that in in the end, they were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Like if they had never traveled this planet, who knows asteroid. what could happen? Or asteroid. <laughs> asteroid. <laughs> asteroid. Asteroid planet. No, I'm kidding. Um, with asteroid gravity with, and with oxygen. With a, and Yeah. With an atmosphere. Nitrogen. Uh, but uh, and you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> this is the actually the um and inspiration of an for six yes yeah, six <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing like um the, he starts talking about happy glaze he starts talking about the so, uh, disease so i don't want to be in like a utopia site setting and then they ask him okay something doesn't really make sense because he tells them they opened in 1973 if it's 1973 and now it's 2185 how are you still alive 
you can kind of gather what's going to happen here where he goes essentially essentially i'm a uh, as he says and one of them does call him wire wick which i thought was kind of funny um <laughs> but it essentially is revealed that he's a scientific he calls himself a scientific device which you know as we know is a, in essence a robot you can tell robot. they're trying to be clever a robot <laughs> yeah a robot they're trying to be clever and of course he's like you know explains to him why he's doing what he's doing and they start showing symptoms that they're getting ready to be they've been poisoned and that they're going to be in die they're going to be killed and be embalmed and he's like you can never leave this place you know you're one of us gooba gobble gooba gobble and that type of thing so, um, i know that reference <laughs> well, but they want an antidote and of course there is no antidote because this is not that type of planet or this is, I'm sorry this is not that type of asteroid this yeah. is yeah. this is the non no antidote to death yeah. unfortunately it ain't that exactly. kind of party buddy <laughs> I, I think they actually called it um infinity serum or something like that or eternity that serum call? i think it's something like that i don't i don't quite remember exactly what it was but it was death infinity serum. or in, in turn, or eternity whatever something so it's a planet with oxygen, or it's an asteroid with oxygen and gravity, but no antidote. It's a nope. quite a hellhole, I guess you could say. But <laughs> um, in essence, what ends up happening is he embalms the, two, the three guys. They're officially dead. They're on this planet, or on this uh, asteroid forever. I'm going to keep calling it a planet. I'm sorry. Um, and he puts them back in the spaceship, the rocket, and kind of like the, one's playing cards, one's looking at the... The, con- the command center ones i think reading the newspaper or something like that and the th- funny thing about this episode and i don't know if you guys agree it seems kind of a waste of space to have um this asteroid with all these people in like all these forms like a kind of a, a zoo for people and stuff like that nobody's ever going to see it because every time they go to the asteroid wickwire wakes up and kills them and stuff like that and it leads back basically back him back to him uh going up to the stairs and you know going back to sleep but it's just it's a really interesting conclusion to an episode that has a, it's very high um high concept in its own right for what it's trying to do and i was actually trying to look up as you guys were talking about what you thought of the the last section and i couldn't find anything on um uh, Crichton and his you know, where he got like westworld and stuff like that so i don't think it was from this but um that pretty much ends the episode in the simple fact of now that we know wickwire is an android or a robot a robot if you want to call it yeah. um he basically is doing his job where he's making sure no one leaves the place because he says at one point he thought they were happy glades the the three astronauts have pretty much been traveling six months to just die on a planet on a asteroid you know so on and so forth so with everything said and done what was your overall feeling in the episode i i to me personally, and I'll, I'll talk about more when we when I get through, you know, with you guys and what you thought. It was I like it. I just like where it headed. So I'll, I'll get more into it. But Alex, um, I know you did a review on this on your channel, and uh, that makes me believe that maybe you like this episode. I don't know. What do you think overall? <laughs> I mean, maybe I like it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I do actually really like the episode. I think the way it's executed from start mm-hmm. to finish, I think, is very well done. I think it's very um what's the word I think it's very tight-knit in terms of like I wouldn't know how to change or alter anything I just think that the way it is executed is done as well as you could with that kind of premise I also Mm. still think having that (laughs) having that car race tableau would have been kind of funny but (laughs) (laughs) that's just me kind of thinking in my head of Mm. hypotheticals but I guess what is interesting too is that for a majority of this episode is taken so seriously and at the very end when Wickwire is dusting all them it's just this oddly upbeat the music track. <laughs> like yeah. all of a sudden it's just like it just feels like almost it has this sort of like cartoony type soundtrack mm. for the end of it to play off of and I think it's it's definitely comical in a sense but it's also kind of disturbing at the same time and I think it's, I guess it's sort of interesting too, because at least you off with this sort of remark of how a lot of people may be concerned with mortality and how you may or may not be remembered by those yeah. you love. And I, and when you're on an asteroid, that's, we'll say million gazillion miles away or whatever, I, <laughs> just a number. Close number. <laughs> <laughs> an infinite amount of miles away, you know, it is interesting to kind of see that, you know, there are a lot of people who unfortunately may not be remembered for generations and generations because 
that just kind of, you know, sometimes that isn't passed on as much as someone may like, or at the time around, at least when they kind of see their demise, it's like, you do wonder how many people are probably looking out for them. But equally, it's because of the soundtrack at the end, it's just sort of like, okay, like, (laughs) I guess they kind of, you know, got what they wanted at the end, but in a weird way like twisted way at the same time i i think when they they say it in the closing monologue so i'm not going to go into it too much but you always have to be it's like a genie's wish you have to be careful how you state what you want because Mm. if you say you want to be rich you know a genie could you know make you a bank robber or you know whatever it might be the one thing i found really interesting with this last bit was they never refer to things as dead like they say they've gone on that they they refer to it as many different things and i'm sure that was something of the time with censors but i found that really interesting yeah it um actually it's interesting because there is um I'll, jacob if you want to go ahead uh, there's also a line that kind of um implies something else as well about this episode so well I, the the end of this had a lot of parallels, a lot of things that got me thinking. Triv got brought up a good point. The whole them getting what they want that was very reminiscent of. Well, really, I guess these things may be reminiscent of that, or vice versa. I don't know. Some of these stories are old, but like the whole genie thing or the monkey's paw specifically. Like yep. oh, like Triv said, oh, I wish I was rich, and then you find out your son gets killed at work, and you get life insurance or something. <laughs> you know, I mean you know yeah you're getting what you wish for which that is what they wished for but it's what twilight zone does best is that ironic twist of fate it's like yeah you're getting it but at what cost and uh, you need to be real specific about what you wish for because (laughs) you're getting to be on that ship for all eternity on your way home that's what you said you wanted (laughs) um but one of the about the whitmore whip whip whatever his name was the guy yeah wickwire I felt like, yeah, I guess they were trying to, they were very vague in what he was, which I thought was good. That made it a bit more timeless because whenever Twilight Zone talks specific about technology, I mean, what, we're 70 years on now, seven, I think, or 60. so, 60, 70 years on. Sometimes it can come across as a bit antiquated. They start talking about robots and we're like, yeah, that's not how that works. I mean, and <laughs> just like with their, with their spaceships and their, their, you know measures of distance and things it doesn't always quite work out well but when they stay vague like that i like that it's not maybe because maybe he's not just a robot in the way that we think he is i'm not sure because they never really specifically say if he his origin is earth or actually of some other origin some other being or some other it feels like they turned him on on the asteroid when they started up the it just like brought him from earth like turned is off that, and then they turned him on they said here's your commands and they just let him do his thing well that's what i'm saying is this place a product of earth or is it like aliens or something some other being mm. made it or beings and then offered it to some of the people of earth or just offered it to some of their people and they look like us and they have been studying us and said hey i really like that americana on earth and this time i want to be there or whatever but either way i thought that was interesting as to like what he was i like how they stayed vague but i was also thinking if they remade this today with like the more modern twilight zone this would totally be a simulation and he would be an ai yep. and they kind of already have not with twilight zone but there's a black mirror episode where people <laughs> that have died they either have died or are dying. They can keep their consciousnesses alive. Yeah, San Junipero. Yeah, that one. And they're like at that beach front area, mm. uh, like a vacation spot. And uh, that's pretty much what that was because these people, and it's not really that far-fetched. I mean, if people got a lot of money, they'll do a lot of crazy stuff. And there are plenty of people that have said, when I die, I want this crazy nonsense to happen so i could totally see people saying hey when you die because you don't care you're dead you get the money to spend we'll put you in this you know we'll pose your body in this place where you'll forever be immortalized and however you want hell yeah there's some rich people out there be like yeah i want to be the mayor of a town and be there and everybody's praising me and i want to be the winner of a pageant contest i want to be the the winner of a race that doesn't get put in the show all that stuff you know i (laughs) I could totally see people doing that. So this isn't while we look at it and we're like, oh, that's kind of goofy and cheesy. Is it really that far out there? I mean, I see people totally going for this. Well, I mean, mean, look at the the, weird shit. Look at the space flights and uh, that um, 
Elon Musk and I think uh, Bezos are giving. I mean, people are paying 175,000, 175,000, a million or whatever money to fly in a space for five seconds. I mean, this is this, this actually, (laughs) yeah, exactly. This actually reminds me, this is going to sound funny. I'm a huge fan of disaster movies, and 2012 is all about rich people having enough money to survive a world apocalypse and it's the same thing here i guarantee you even though it's not stated and i guarantee you all these people either fled earth or fled somewhere before the 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 atomic thing eventually went down and they're like i'm gonna pay a lot of money for this mortuary and then you know happy glades is gonna keep me intact for forever and i feel like that's you know like what's happening is all these people like you said jacob were just rich people who had money to spare and they didn't know what else to do with this so they're like hey put me on a madame tussaud you know (laughs) place where i can be looked at forever and well, look at look at the look at the pyramids. Look at any fancy mm. fancy um oh what the, mausoleum. I mean, people pay to to show off the money that they have, even if there's no one around. And yep. to some extent, like one other thing, I got thinking of at the end of the episode, um, right before it went into the the um the epilogue, Wickwire says something to the extent of, you know, your men, you have to you know, you have to die basically because of what had happened on earth with the atomic bomb and such. So I think that was, you know, he wasn't going to let him live regardless because of the, you know, the reputation that mankind has. Yeah. The one thing that, that was never touched on that I do wonder, because I I'm, I'm down with all that. I think that, and I alluded to, I think it's just a bunch of rich people that said, when I'm dead, whatever, I'll spend more of my money and I'll be famous, immortalized. Who's coming to look at all this stuff besides the robot? I mean, who who do people visit this place like a cemetery? I mean, it, he says it's a cemetery. Do people do shuttles come there and people just walk through and say, "Oh, look, you know, hey, that's my great grandfather and he's dead," and all these other people? Are. Who is this for? I mean, it's for the dead people, but even rich people that are going to die. If you said, "Hey, we'll do this for you," and they're like, "Okay, who's going to see it?" Nobody. What? Then why am I going to do it? I mean, where are the people that are visiting this cemetery? And well, again, if I, people I, are visiting, why couldn't these astronauts just be visitors? Or does everybody who go there is this is this AI gone rogue or this this robot? And if you show up there, you're part of it now. <laughs> well, I, I think <laughs> if you look at it again, take it back to like the pyramids. They did these gorgeous paintings. The sarcophaguses were the sarcophagi were you know yeah. so elegant and beautiful and. All this stuff, you know, all of their all of their possessions were brought in. Those suckers were sealed and never meant to be reopened. It was to celebrate them in the afterlife. And regarded, I know this isn't quite the same thing as far as we know, but I think that's kind of the idea that they're going for with this. Yeah, it is for them, for nobody else, even if no one ever sees it. But I feel like people that would do this, that would pay for this and contract all it, because I feel like that was like pharaohs and kings and stuff, and everybody else did that. They said, oh, he's a king. We're gonna do that. Somebody who would pay for this and like go to a company, and I know we're getting kind of like real granial here. And (laughs) if Starling were here, he'd be like, "Just shut up and enjoy (laughs) it." But um, the I feel like people that would do that are are vain. Somebody who's gonna set themselves up to be the mayor of a town, immortalized like this with a bunch of people praising them. That's a very vain person. They want people to see that. That ain't for them. I mean, it's for them, but they want that recognition even after death. True. So I'm like. I don't know who's seen it. I guess nobody. Once again, I don't think they really were saying, "Hey, you guys, uh, go deep dive on this. Just be ooh and ah over, the, <laughs> over what happens." But overall, um, I, I'm kind of uh, dodging the point. Uh, I did enjoy this episode. I thought it was. Uh, I like any of the episodes that I can't see from like at least the halfway point. Usually, from the halfway point, I kind of got a pretty good idea what's going on. I like the ones that keep me guessing. And uh, I didn't really know exactly what was going on until it wanted me to know it or roundabout with the drinks and everything. So, yeah, I did enjoy this one. It's not like, I mean, I know, Alex, you, I think you said this is one of your favorites or one you really like. Not my favorite, but I did enjoy it. It's, you know, a very solid episode. And, uh, yeah, I had a good time with it. There, to me personally, in this episode, as you guys have covered, I think this is like a secret top secret project that nobody really knew about outside of rich people. And that's why they maybe they don't visit. And on top of that, there was an atomic war 200 years ago. So maybe it was one of those plans where people forgot about, unless you're like super in the know and you know, that type of thing. I know it's like a little basic on the kind of explanation, but 
I, I'm kind of curious of how long Wickwire was. Did he say how long he's been asleep for when they he when they woke him up? I think he I said think somewhere was... around 200 years. Yeah, because he, he hadn't seen anybody okay. since 1985, really. So I think maybe that. Yeah, maybe that's what happened. Maybe when he shut down, it just they forgot about it, and it's just been landing. It's been sitting there for however long, and these three astronauts just happened to be the people that just came. You know, the new people and. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, leaning into like nuclear holocaust and, you know, like like you said, Triv, there's the the last statement that he says before basically he goes and, you know, falls asleep again, which is you are here, you are men. It's not the exact same, but and while men are here, there could be no peace. And it's in essence, to me personally, a little bit about, you know, the, the, the destruction that we cause and the idea of these three guys living on this planet or on this asteroid, and I keep saying planet, we'll just call it an asteroid. Um, <laughs> I think he was just doing what his programming said, but there's always a worry that these guys are going to tell their friends. And then, you know, like in Wayne's world again, he's going to tell his friends and he's going to tell his friends and he's going to do his friends and stuff like that. And that I think that's where, you know, on top of what you guys were talking about, I think that's also where it leans into because you got to remember, this is also during the Cold War, uh, you know, portions of the Cold War and stuff like that. You know, I'm sure... This is very much on Rod, Rod Sterling and Charles Beaumont's mind about just the idea of, I mean, you see it today, just how we impact the world and stuff like that. And that's what I kind of delved into a little bit. What's also awesome is you guys came up with more stuff that I even thought about because I always leaned into like the the nuclear war and the, the Holocaust, which is very prevalent in a lot of these episodes, you know, racism and Holocaust and stuff like that. So um, it's definitely an episode that has a lot more to say than I was ever expecting and i'm glad that you guys found more to say about than even i thought about so i thought that's pretty cool but we also um, skipped something there's what, what's that uh, the fisherman when they go and like push mm-hmm. him over which i'm assuming he was one of the actual people doing what he loved fishing yeah when we find out what's really going on there these guys have essentially just desecrated a dead body at that point oh you're yeah. right just throwing that out there and now i mean they they just went through and I think that's against the law. <laughs> maybe, so maybe that's that why asteroid. the robot. Yeah, maybe. Well, maybe that's why the robot was went all homicidal. Like, he's, nope. he's like yelling at the pageant lady and stuff like that. So yeah. no <laughs> yelling at the dead bodies. Exactly. Yeah. Do not feed the dead bodies. Yeah. I mean, um. um <laughs> so with that said, either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so with that said, before we get into the uh, the closing narration, was there anything else you guys wanted to talk about? Was there anything? that you wanted to lean in on like uh on the plot or is there anything else you want to talk about before we move on to kind of the last segment and then the closing narration so anything i love the reaction shots there were a lot of reaction shots here Mm. something would happen and it would zoom in every time it would do each individual guy three times like that guy puts the newspaper down and you have one guy like and then another's like and they're like everyone get we get the close-up reaction shots from every each three of them every time something happened i loved it yeah it was definitely of the time if i ever make a movie Um, i'm gonna have lots of reaction shots (laughs) extreme close-ups of me just going oh (laughs) Oh, like with anime voiceover kind of oh (laughs) that's gonna be my movie the whole thing's just gonna be two hours of that It's like Kung Pao under the fist where they do the exactly. like the well. push in. <laughs> uh, but what about you, uh, Alex and Trip? Did you guys have anything else you wanted to, to touch up on before we continue? I know I the so. cinematography. I mm, feel yeah. like we definitely mentioned on that earlier, but kind of going off of uh, what Jacob said about the reactions, I think what makes it work is that the cinematography definitely aimed at um just trying to focus on a lot of the subjects and constantly having the camera moving which i feel is also pretty distinct and like added to the illusion they do mention or at least allude in the companion books that they were like oh yeah we tried this but it didn't really work but i think it does add to it overall and i think for a lot of those shots to be one takes especially with that much versatility in shot composition i think it's pretty I mean, it's pretty well done for the time and even now. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that. I, I took, uh, I didn't make a note, but I did notice 
And the first time it kind of like sprung to mind was when um, he walks in the, I think it's like a hotel room or something like that. And he's like, oh, excuse me, ma'am. And it like pans around the room and you see them. Mm -hmm. Those types of shots. I mean, they're not like revolutionary or anything, but I mean, they were really well done. You don't, we didn't get a lot of that from Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone is, it has camera movement, but it's been a lot more traditional, like static camera where it just shows like the set, almost like a play or a, a, a sitcom or something where it just shows the set and people move about it. And we might have like close ups and stuff. Yeah, yeah Dutch, angle. Dutch angles. <laughs> we might have close ups, but there's not like a lot of camera movement and following because the cameras were huge back then. Yeah. So I did think that the way the camera was sweeping around the rooms and moving around and like as it told a story too, it would start here and he we see him walk in and he says something traditionally in twilight zone it would just switch angles to another camera but here it pans around the room as we slowly see oh we're like what's the person doing over there we can't see what's she doing is she naked did he just walk in on her on the toilet or something no she's like <laughs> dancing with this guy and i thought that was a really that was for back then if you see how big those cameras were they used that was something pretty impressive they did there so yeah i know yeah. Cinematography was actually really good considering what they had to work with back in the day. One kind of fun little trivia thing is the fact that um, Cecil, the, the guy that played uh, Wickwire, uh, Cecil uh, Calloway. Yeah. DeMille? He died. Um, he said that the mortuary began in 1973 and he actually passed away in 1973. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> he predicted his death. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I definitely agree they're they're doing stuff in the twilight zone like psycho like you know uh citizen kane is that the war movie i'm thinking of where they're they're invent <laughs> they're doing stuff that actually becomes inventive and becomes actually important to filmmaking because you know now it's you know a lot of the same shows and they use a lot of the same techniques and these are the shows and movies that you know brought that about so doing that kind of stuff they did in this episode is definitely worthy point out of just trying to you know how moving along the you know the future of cinema and tv and stuff like that so i think the main question that we've not touched on here that um i think we we slightly touched on it but the big question the most important question concerning twilight zone in this episode is at what point in the story does nan adam show up <laughs> and murder you, you didn't see the or would you she see the car be, would this be the final episode in the Nan Adams series where we just see her in her own little diorama or whatever? <laughs> like she was the car part that we we that was cut. It's a deleted scene. It 100 percent is that. release the Nan Adams cut. <laughs> the real question before we get into the closing narration is: What lexicon word did you add this week? Oh, I didn't. I, I actually, <laughs> there wasn't anything that I picked up on. Yeah, there really I was wasn't. In a, I was in a mad dash to watch this episode because I was behind. No, yeah, I said he did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed that. Jake, blink twice if you liked Elegy. Well, <laughs> he, he's actually in Elegy right now. He's in the uh, <laughs> in the podcast room. <laughs> yeah, him and Jeff will spend forever as a tableau. Yeah, no, no, I don't like this at all. <laughs> <laughs> no welcome sir, back like <laughs> oh was i gone i, yes. was, just, yeah. I was talking the whole time <laughs> <laughs> which is not yeah. out of the ordinary but still <laughs> all right jacob before your internet freezes again and we we won't definitely like that um go ahead and uh, hit us with the closing narration oh of course of course that's my job <clears throat> kirby weber and myers three men lost they shared a common wish a simple one, really. They wanted to be aboard their ship headed for home. And fate, a laughing fate, a practical jokester with a smile stretched across the stars, saw to it that they got their wish with just one reservation. The wish came true, but only in the Twilight Zone. Okay, so with that said, that is Elegy. Um, I think we're all pretty much under the you know same conclusion that it's a fun, entertaining episode. You know, we'll find out where it lands on the the Twilight Zone list. But yeah, so let's go ahead and do that. The Twilight Zone ranking list, as we do every week, that I definitely did not steal from another podcast. Okay, so walking distance number one. I don't think this is going to be a walking distance uh, type episode. The Fever, the greatest episode of all time. Not really. Uh, number nineteen. <laughs> 
It's better than as I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so is this but I I know I always say this all the time. Is this above or below escape clause? Alex, I'll let you go first. You've seen all these episodes, so from this list, from the rankings, would you put it above escape clause and as well as you guys other? I would say it's above escape clause, I think. Mm-hmm. I agree. Escape clause is the one with the guy devil who yeah. kills himself yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's above escape clause. So here remains the question. How far up this list would you go? Would you go as high as the hitchhiker? Would you go below the hitchhiker? Would you take it up near time enough at last? Me personally, this would be in my top five, top ten, somewhere around there. But where where would you guys see this sitting at? Like that's the that's the true question. As yeah. long as we know it's above escape clause, which is always that that middle point. Um, it really kind of is. That's crazy. Like it has continued yeah. to be like that. Yeah. It's always kind of balanced. Right. For me, um, I know I usually let Triv go, but I'm just going no, go to ahead. say, because I mean, and this, I, like I said, I thought this was a solid episode, so we could move up for me. Mm. I didn't think it was a bad episode, but when I think about, I look at the Escape Paul's one, it's better than that. But Third from the Sun, I really like Third from the Sun, and I really like Third from the Sun's uh, ending, because that's that's the one where they're on the other planet, and then we yep. think it's Earth. But yeah. yeah. Um, I really like the ending of Third from the Sun. So that sticks out a little bit more to me than this one did. It could go above it. That'd be cool. But if you just said, hey, you place it, you're the one in charge, I would probably put it under or above, you know, Third from the Sun above it. And then it above Escape Clause. So I guess number nine. Make maybe. it number eight. Or not, number yeah. eight? Number. No, yeah. it would make it number nine. Number, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, we can go, if it went up from there, I'm not mad about it uh those top nine are such good like they're all very solid episodes the the concept of this was fun it was it was a fun watch it, the the ending like it's got that love like a dark ending and especially from something in the 60s like it does have that thing that a lot of these other ones don't have maybe right below hitchhiker i i we, like i i don't i don't i don't 100 percent know like i i can't i don't know like there the hitchhiker is has such a i don't know it's got nan adams it does have <laughs> nan adams and she's it's, been, got, a, it's got a linchpin yeah exactly i mean and she did cause and the uh, shoulders yes exactly yeah. and she caused the rocket to go off course and have to back its ass up all the way down to the planet so that's where nan comes in yes she's just driving she, through space now as she was driving what was last week's episode did she did she use the, the hose to, during, during the gas into her gas tank because she ran out of gas yes the one before that. What was the one before last week? Wasn't it fever? The, the fever? Oh yeah. What, what, there was one where she was on another planet. I don't know. Uh, while she was traveling to another planet, she hit them off course. It well, she was the asteroid episode. that caused she them was, to go off course. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She hit their ship and threw them off course. They came out of cryo sleep <laughs> or whatever in their little <laughs> pod, or they were sleeping in their little safety chair, and they were like, "Oh no, where are we? We got hit by a Plymouth." Buick or whatever. <laughs> or well, a, that the, the fifty-seven car was, Ford. <laughs> the, the car was probably made better than that whole rocket, so uh, it definitely uh, was. The car yeah. had safer seats than that rocket too. Yeah, exactly. They both had bench seats. <laughs> Do you think? You think she attached her attached herself to the rocket like uh, Han Solo did with the garbage, or was it Boba Fett it was in, Boba in Fett. Star Wars? Yeah, and uh, she siphoned the gas from the rocket. That's why it ran out of gas. Actually, it was both but, of those Boba Fett and Han Solo. So. Yeah. Yeah. Star Wars what about podcast. you, Alex? Where would you put it like above third from the sun? Would you put it? I mean, where would you put it? To be fairly honest, it, 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 it gets harder and harder every week to kind of find a spot. But can we do yeah. get to episode? My list, to, my list will definitely be a little different. Than this yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the question is, where would like, you put the move. fever on this list? <laughs> <laughs> oh bottom 100 percent. okay yeah. okay you're still on board <laughs> <laughs> yeah that if you that said above just... that i would have said nick i need you to send those host controls <laughs> just, just one second <laughs> no i there was a it was a good decision i think um <laughs> i would say hmm, it's so hard to choose but i think i personally put it above third from the sun i know that might be kind of a hot take <laughs> no not at all um no but i i just say that just because all it's a good episode in terms of it being well-rounded whereas opposed to at least from what i remember from third from the sun i feel like it doesn't really pick up until maybe like the second half of the episode for me personally that's true 
um, especially with its kind of larger reveal at the very end. So that's why I would probably put it slightly above, but I do feel like those kind of work in tandem because of them being like off the planet Earth sort of thing. But I don't know. They do have I some would... similarities. I think yeah. I think you're right, honestly, because I'm I'm gonna retract my previous statement because uh <laughs> I think it probably would go above Third from the Sun because Third from the Sun was just kind of a nothing burger of an episode and it had a banger ending. Like the ending was like, oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and that really made it. You take that ending out, which I mean, the ending is part of it. You can't do that. But if you look at the rest of the episode, it wasn't bad, but it was just kind of. <laughs> well, I will like to add that Third from the Sun had a funky phone without a nine on the on the, the dial thing. So that, that had- does make it pretty awesome. And it had the creepy dude looking over the, the window. So. <laughs> it's Wilson from uh, Home Improvement. Yeah, it just had a great ending, and that's what made it. And yes, Wilson and all that was in it, because I could hear you guys. But um, <laughs> I think it had a great ending. But if you take that away, it was just kind of a, yeah, this episode's whatever. So yeah, I think that it would actually go above third from the sun, honestly, is just an entire episode. Yeah, I'm um here's where I stand. I think you're right. You guys are all right with the third from the sun. It has a great ending, but I think seven more to go. Yeah. I think <laughs> I um the 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 funny thing about that third from the sun is when we talk that's the first point we talked about like how far it is away from Earth and stuff like that. And it's it really funny. It's like yeah. 20 27 million miles or something small amount. But what you need, I really like more just on the simple fact that that ending is so just kind of shocking you just die you really don't see it coming if you think about it um, came out of you like a car that, out of nowhere that, yeah <laughs> it was shoes flying in the air it was it was great you know and you had that the, whole the, ending was batshit insane yeah. <laughs> and th- those episodes sometimes are what make twilight zone so special it was on that that thing like i said hitchhiker for chance of dream one for the angels all that stuff above definitely not better than that but I, I can see it above third from the sun. I was between those two below or above it. And you guys made a pretty good case about going above third from the sun, because like I said, it has, it has an interesting look about uh, war and nuclear, you know, stuff like that. But this one, it just has more punch to it. Literally not figuratively in literally a <laughs> punch drinking punch, but um, so Adam. yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good spot. Um, I think 16 millimeter shrine needs to move up to like number. I think seven. You, I think we're not. <laughs> because... I think, uh, where's the mute button on here? Where's the mute button? <laughs> hey, it's 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 set. It's sets have been seen a couple of times. So by that alone, it should move up. Well, no, it's because At they least said, above hey, we gotta where's get everybody? Else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the more we think about it, that probably would. I think it would, like when we get done with this entire uh, run through of the series, I might let some. I might let us all like move an episode in a different place, and we're gonna see Jacob move like the most random episode. And Trish like, we need to put sixty millimeter shrine up there and all that stuff. So. Top five, baby. <laughs> exactly. So I might do that um, with Triv just to get under your skin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. He's gonna move. He's gonna move the Jezbel up to number one. Oh God! I mean, <laughs> more power to you. I'm, the four I'm of us here. are dying. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I have um, a question. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's nothing bad. This is a question for Alex, honestly, because she said her her uh, list would be different. Um, not to derail things, but just curious on no. your list from these twenty. Now, uh, I guess it's three questions. One: What would be your number one out of these? What would be your bottom? And I think we may have covered that. And what would also be like, what are, are, are there any like major differences in ours from yours? Are you like, Oh God, I'd never put that one way up there or way down there. Just curious. I'm so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do think walking distance would be my number one out of the first 20 episodes. The fever I would most definitely place towards the bottom. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, for people no, who like that episode. Well, no, who likes that episode. <laughs> the, the fun, I mean, well, the for funny people thing. People who listen, you know, I just like yeah. it's all subjective. Um, well, the, the funny know, thing about the yeah. Oh no, no! I was gonna say the funny thing about the fever is we we were. I actually thought that was gonna be above the four of us are dying, and mm. uh, no, it didn't work out like that. So sure did. Anyway, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, um, man, I just the fever was just interesting. <laughs> to say the least yeah. but i guess a few episodes are just sort of like that um 
Hmm. That's I guess such a so nice I, way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm with Triv in that I would put 16 millimeter shrine just a just a little more than at 17. Um, I also would probably place the last flight perhaps in the top five. Um, I definitely I kind of mentioned this to Nick and Triv before we started, but I definitely want to watch the Purple Testament again because I feel like a lot of the episodes pertaining to war definitely sort of like melded quite a bit for me so I feel like maybe I just didn't remember that episode that well um but yeah I think for the most part you know it's kind of where I would put it hypothetically um you know I just think in my opinion you know Alleji's in a Alleji's in a good spot um and the fever unfortunately should probably be last yeah Woo-hoo! I probably well- should also watch <laughs> what you need again because um I, so, I think I think it's just because that and Mr. Den on Doomsday because they both had like peddlers, I think got stuck in my head. So I yeah. I probably should on the differentiate Testament, them a little more. You were talking about the Purple Testament. One of the things I don't know if you watched our episode of that last week, but one of the things that really kind of put it over the edge for I think all of us was the story was interesting. We all commented on yeah, it's an interesting story. It's a very traditional Twilight Zone story. But the way mm-hmm. that it was made, the care that was taken, the performances and everything, which I mean, I love the Twilight Zone, but honestly, the performances are very much of their time in most of these. I would never say, man, that's an Oscar winning performance. They're just of their time and that's fine. But that one in particular was very different in the way it was shot, in the tone of it and in the performances, it all was like very well done. And you could tell that Serling because he played a big hand. I mean, he plays a big hand in all of them, but that one in particular, I think was close to his heart because he was a soldier and he was in that specific where that one takes place. And I think it was the, uh, it was the Eastern Philippines. Fil- yeah. Was, Philippine islands. That's where he was stationed and during that war. So I think that that one in particular, like meant a lot to him and you could tell that he put a lot of extra care into it. And that really did play. I know for me, and I think judging on whatever uh, uh, Triv and Nick said, it played into our rating of it and did for me put it way up there it really stood out just because like all the performances especially were leagues above anything else in the twilight zone up to that point not that there's bad performances in the twilight zone they're just very a product of their time but that one right there was like wow you could tell they were like doing some legit acting there yeah there's definitely a few war related stories that i think can definitely i would say challenge the purple testament actually that would come in later Cool. At least oh, for right. me. So yeah. we like you know, challenges. A, <laughs> a challenge? Yes. Now, is there a 17 millimeter shrine? I have to know. <laughs> no, but the actress in 16 millimeter shrine directed the mask, which is in season oh, yeah. five. So that's I such a good episode. episode. There's always that to look yeah. forward to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so, with that said, uh, LG new number eight, walking distance still number one. The fever is now at number 20, getting more and more complicated as it goes along. <laughs> With that said, we are the next episode is also as uh, Jacob usually says a banger of an episode um, is of course Mirror Image. It's not if I read if I listened to the end of the on Paramount Plus when they showed the ending of the episode and they talk about Ross Serling talks about the episode. It says in Wikipedia, which you should probably never trust, that it was written by Ross Serling. I don't think it was written by Ross Serling. I can't remember, but it was written by someone Vera else. Miles. No, Vera was... Miles is the actress in it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but it's, it's I'll look it up the next time we talk about the episode. But um, Vera Miles is the 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 main actress in it. She's a famous actress, really good yes. at what she does, and I look forward to that. And like I said, the next episode after that, to me personally, one of the greatest episodes of all time. So with that said, that's going to do it. That's going to be take our take on season one, episode twenty, which of course is Elegy, Alex. It's been awesome. I know we, we've been talking for quite a while, but it really is awesome to have people come on that love the Twilight Zone. Even if you watch it recently, if you watch it 20 years ago, if you watch it, you know, whenever <laughs> it, it, it makes for it makes. For, yeah, it makes for a great you know, talk because the Twilight Zone is so important. But with that said, as we end, uh, where can they find your content? Where can they find your channel? All that good stuff. Twitter, anything that you want to promote? Um, so I don't have social media, but um, I do have a YouTube channel that's just Alex Carson. Uh, and that's it. Just awesome. the one place to find me. It's I try to make, keep it 
and <laughs> trying to keep it relatively easy to figure That's out where why I you're am so and nice. Doing, so. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got a really awesome playlist of uh, her favorite uh, Twilight Zone apps that are is very well worth a look. It's incredibly well put together. It is it is inclusive, like it is very well done. So I highly started worth watching them. I started watching them this afternoon, actually. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm glad more people are, especially after I released them all. I feel like there's definitely been a lot more traction with them. Um, That's good. Afterwards, so I'm very yeah. happy about it. Awesome. And I will have an honorable mentions video out of other Twilight Zone episodes at some point. So nice. hopefully yeah, I can get to that, that sooner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Alex, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. So. You two that I see every week, it seems like, except for when somebody's moving. Triv, <laughs> you were wearing a pizza on your head. Uh, so where can they find your pizza flavored channel? Oh, that's all I have. Compared to what I've had before, that's what I have for this week. So <laughs> you Better can find something you asked her about one time. Yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. I'm still oh, I'm God. still in I'm still getting over that. Uh, you can oh, find yeah, my sure. very, very cheesy content here on YouTube at uh, Trivial Theater. Um, I just put up um, one uh, a, a review of Space Truckers. Uh, so awesome. It was, yes, it was uh, lots of space pants were involved as well as uh, Dennis Hopper and many, many, many other things. Definitely come over and check it out. Um, yeah. You can also see me on Twitter at Trivia underscore check. And Jacob, when we uh, see your meme flavored uh, eyeball inducing content that you actually finally got back to after you know a week off uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, where, where can they find their where they can find their content? i'm glad you asked <laughs> yeah uh anyway uh y- you can find me on twitter at times uh when my internet's working at at red neville two and uh i i i respond to things and laugh at things on there and mostly though you can find me on youtube at jacob Andrews reviews where i typically release uh content usually movie reviews every single day right now doing every other day for about a week or two while i get finished moving in and uh i've got some new ventures that i'm about to start on youtube as well some other stuff that's coming soon so check all that out um kind of kind of uh mad at triv right now because she did space truckers and i was actually gearing up to do a space truckers review at some point now i feel so do I it can't, i can't do it not yet Why? i have to give it time because dude hit it hit while the iron is it. hot that's strike while the iron is hot the, the, I can't the more do it, that's I... out there it's a thing it's a thing you <laughs> you have thing. space pants are you lacking space pants i can borrow you it's mine probably that it's probably my space pants they got a hole in them you know, COVID weight don't fit on them quite like I used to. So <laughs> got to hit that gym. Mine are and, stretchy. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that they'd probably fit your anus. They might, but would they? All right. All right. All right. Enough, <laughs> of this, yeah, enough of this. Enough of this. Um, so but yeah, anyway, that's where you can find me. <laughs> yeah. And a so, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Oh, sir, I don't yes, like it. Can, <laughs> So anyways, you can find me at Movie Emporium, channel's Movie Emporium, where I you know post reviews and all that good stuff. Once again, we are on iTunes and Apple Podcasts or whatever we're on, you know, the rate desk, all that good stuff. But for Alex, Jacob, Triv, and myself, we'll see you guys next time on the uh, Twilight Zone for the Fifth Dimension. Peace out. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> He's hitting record. That means we've got a solid 45 minutes before we start talking about the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, no joke. <laughs> Oh, Classic. those Hershey squirts. Uh, <laughs> what do you eat to get those? <laughs> no joke. Last week's, uh, we were an hour and 20 minutes in the recording before we started actually podcasting. Oh, good Lord. Oh. Yeah, we, did, <laughs> we did good last week. That was quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>